What makes you decide to pick up a book? That is the question we are going to dive into today in our Keep It Fictional Book Chat episode. I am Virginia. I am here with my two book friends from the Port Moody Public Library, Miss Corinne and and Liz. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something. You look like you are going to say something. I thought I was going to say something too. And then I forgot what to say and or how to turn on a microphone. So right. hello. It's all good. It's all good. Well, we are recording. There's a reason. I think there's a legit reason why we're all a little out of it today. Because we're recording on December 31st, last day of 2021. So, I mean, Corinne seems to be pretty excited about that. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> she, she's really happy to say bye to this year. Um, yeah, and I'm just, I don't know, end of the year for me is always kind of weird. So I don't know how I feel about it, you know, and, and I think in the past few years, they're all the same anyway. Every day is the same. They all blend into each other. So what is a new year? What is an old year? I don't know. But um, I thought I would start because it's the last day of the year. I would love to know from my book friends, what is the last book you're going to read this year? Or maybe you already read it and you decide tonight is not a day for reading. I don't know. But what is that last book you're going to read? Liz. Okay, so I always feel the pressure um, to pick a really good one for my last of the year. You know, strong finish get you excited about reading in the next year. Um, so I have started this one already just in case I needed to um, find an alternate. <laughs> so I am partway through this one. I am very um, satisfied with it so far. This one is called Lemon and it is by Kwon Yo Sun. And um, Kwon Yo Sun is a Korean author. So this book was originally published in Korean and has been translated into English and a relatively quick translation. Sometimes we don't see these come out for years, um, but this was only written um, and published two years ago. Um, so pretty excited about this one, heard a lot of good buzz. Um, pretty short novel and it uh, talks about a high school student's murder um, from the perspective of her sister, as well as uh, other female characters that attended the school. So it's like a look back. Um, we don't know who did it yet. I don't know who did it yet. Um, but we see from their perspectives, um, you know, their take on what kind of went on, what kind of person, um, all of the, the different characters, um, you know, how they perceive other people to be. And so far it is a bit of a psychological trip. So just right up my alley <laughs> so so far so good nice and you said the magic word murder yeah exactly yeah. Well, murder is not year. here to hear it because fiona was like wondering why there's no murder in the past few episodes but well thank you for bringing that back so no problem but podcast Korea, what are you going to be reading what is your last book yeah. So kind of like Liz, I do feel like a little bit of pressure, but for me, the most important book is like the first book that I read on New Year's day. That to me is the most important ending the year. It's kind of like, eh, whatever. I, I do love a new year. I love a new beginning. I knew I, I love a new, like fresh page on my Goodreads challenge. I love any excuse to wear my BT 21 headband in celebration. Um, so I, I will be perfectly honest that I'm probably going to read two books uh, today. Um, one of them that I'm going to finish, um, which is a bit of a cheat because I actually started reading it on Webtoons and then the hold came in. So I'm going to finish it. And that is the graphic, the breakaway hit uh, graphic novel Lore Olympus volume one by Rachel Smythe, which is kind of like a retelling of the uh, Persephone, Hades. I hesitate to call it a love story because in the original myth, kidnapping is not love kid I, i'm going to do a controversial statement kidnapping is not love um but it's kind of retold um with amazing art uh, strangely enough i do think virginia has also read this one which you know a, a virginia always zagging on us always zagging because i would not have thought that this would be a one that you picked up because it is 
it is like a romance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The- what is one a bunch of awards? So I'm just like, okay, well, I want to see what that's all about. And that's what we were talking about earlier. Like, I think it's the art that really draws me in and just the way she frames the difference, um, like angles of the, you know, how she draw the different angles. I really like that. And I like the colors because it looks kind of dark and stuff. So I was like, and it is Persephone and Hades, right? Like, so, but yes, I was not expecting as much romance. I don't know what I was thinking because I didn't really know a lot about it before I went into it. So I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of romance in it, but it's, it's okay. Can do. And the other book you said you're going to read? Uh, the other book that I'm going to read is one that I have been slowly chipping away. It's from RM's book list, and it is E.H. Uh, e. Gombrich's The Story of Art. It is like a 700-page treatise about what art is from the beginning of art history until kind of modernism and I can only read a couple of pages a night because it makes me nice and dozy. Um, But it is probably what I'm going to read for the last. I'm trying to gain an appreciation of like abstract and modernist art. And I'm hoping this book is going to help me because I'm not there yet. Um, But it's written in a very engaging, um, kind of like someone just like sitting down to chat. Who's like, you know what? I'm not going to fiddle faddle around with all those complex words to describe art. I'm just going to talk to you like we're a friend talking about this extremely dumb statue. You make a sound so appealing. I'm trying. I'm trying, RM. <laughs> oh, yeah. What about you, Virginia? What are you what are you closing? Hold on, closing the chapter yeah. on this year with. Closing. Yes. Same. So same thing, like I mean, like all of you. Like it's just like you want it to be good. And I think I'm not gonna be able to finish it tonight. So it's kind of like it's gonna lead into the next the next day which is the new year which again same thing you want it to be a good one um so i read a book which i'm going to talk about in our most anticipated episode upcoming and it was so good so good that i just need to go grab her first book right away um so i have got in from the library we need new names um by novella bulaweo um and i'm just so good so good the first book like it's just like a born storyteller like just the way like I was I was like have to stop myself and I have to just like read those words out loud like this is like 4 a.m in the morning I shouldn't be reading out loud at all but I just couldn't help it because just the words are so good um so this one is about a uh, 10 year girl um named Darling she lives in Zimbabwe um and she's dealing with like like pretty like horrible life there after their homes have been destroyed the school have closed you know the dads all have to go and you know live abroad to get jobs and stuff like that and um she has now a chance to escape her aunt lives in america and so she thought well america you know like the famous america um it's going to be great and so of course she travels to live with her aunt and of course it turns out that options for a new immigrant is not as great as they sound. So um, that is not, I don't think it's it's like a book that I would normally pick up, but I, I trust this author. It's, I feel like it's going to be amazing just because she's so good and um, just love the storytelling. So I, I think it's going to be good. So um, looking forward to picking that up tonight. So I'm curious. So the new book, is that also literary fiction? Because I've read We Need New Names and it was very good. The new book is Glory, um, mm-hmm. and it is a anthropomorphized animal fable type book um, about a, uh, yeah, about sort of that, yeah. <laughs> but but you, you very immediately forget that they are animals, I have to say, like, which I normally, I also, I guess, also something that I don't gravitate towards, but um, you do forget that they are horses and cats and no 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 it's really good really good no i'm sorry i, I watched a black beauty movie interpretation at too young an age i can't nothing to, nothing like that nothing like yeah but that. a anyway. bad thing is going to happen to a horse like you know a bad thing is going to happen oh, but, to a horse but this is okay that a bad thing happens to them i think because they are a dictator so you know they're a bad bad horse <laughs> bad horse <laughs> bad horse <laughs> basically yeah um yeah so um anyway we'll tell you more about that later so yes so exciting books i hope you also have got some exciting books lined up for your um for your 
last day of the year for your new year. But I forgot to ask, like, what I guess to go with the topic for the day. What makes you decide to pick up the book that you just talked about? Like, you know, um, or, or actually, just what makes you decide to pick up a book? Is it like a gorgeous cover that you want to show off on the SkyTrain? Is it like because it's a fame, you know, a, a favorite series, favorite author? Is it because it's got a good color palette? Like, what is it that makes you pick up a book usually? Like, what would be your like number one reason for pick up a book? And and it depends, it's not an answer list, just <laughs> Because I know that's what you're going to say. It depends. <laughs> mm, this is tough because, and I think actually Liz and I have something in common that we're both mood readers. And so it kind of like, oh gosh, I don't want to say the word it depends, but it's kind of like, I feel where the wind is blowing within my heart, within like the chambers of my heart cavity. And I just kind of like go that. But um, I think the number one thing that can probably make me pick up a book more than the author and more than a personal recommendation is if the premise is really good. Like if there's something in the description that kind of the, the description or um, the plot summary that really catches my eye, then I'm more likely to pick it up. Just thinking of the past few books that I picked up because of that and then hated. Um, but that's still what drew me to them in the first place. This? Yeah, I think um, since I can't use my go-to line, um, yeah, along those same lines as Corrine, um, I think, how do I feel about the premise at the time that I want to pick up a book? And, um, you know, they all kind of promise something like this book is a evocative emotional thriller that will keep you on sus in suspense until the very end and then I'm like really really are you really going to do that for me and if I if it intrigues me enough then I will pick it up to find out if it is true or not I feel like uh, Liz and I do like vibe checks on books <laughs> like oh does this does this pass our vibe check I'm so skeptical <laughs> so skeptical because I feel like Liz we've been burned in the past um so much burned. disappointment yeah, not to, not to name any names, but the last book I read, uh, the premise was great and it was awful. And I'm angry at the book. I'm angry at the author. I'm angry at myself. Like, how dare you waste such a good premise? Well, and, well two things. First of all, stop reading it. <laughs> Don't have to finish. Um, but the other thing, I think it leads to kind of like today's um, today's topic, because I feel like a vibe check for me, I can do it probably much better not from necessarily the premise, because do I trust what, the, like, you know, like, listen, do I trust what the publisher is selling me? I don't know. But I feel that with some of the blurbs from the books by other authors, often give me a better sense of what this book vibe is going to be. Because, yes, I know sometimes it's like, well, friends writing, <laughs> recommending books. Well, they're, they're friends books, I get it. But I find that like, it, you know, if it is a book that has a blurb by Lee Child, you kind of know like the style of the book, right? You know, like it, it gives you much better sense than the plot because the plot, you know, could be interesting, could be not, but like, like it could be interesting premise, but written by different people could be very, very different. So I find that those little blurbs kind of does help, you know, to get a sense of what this book will be. Like if, you know, it's a, if it's a book blurb by like, like, yeah, like certain people, then you're like, okay, it's probably going to be about that style. And do I like that style? Yes, great. So this may be a book for you. So I find that that really helpful um, in some ways. Um, so for today, that's kind of our topic is that we have um, chosen books that we are, we have picked up because it was blurred by an author or it's recommended by an author that we respected, that we like, that we trust. So I would love to know from everybody when they're telling us about the book, like read the blur that intrigued you and, um, and then tell us about the book. So should we start with Liz again? Liz, what is the book that you have picked up? Nice segue, by the way. Well done. <laughs> All right. So, um... This is a book that I have 
mentioned on a previous episode, if you go way back in the Keep It Fictional canon, um, it was um, a book on one of my most anticipated lists. And I've gotten flack for not actually following through on reading the most anticipated list. Look at you, Corey. However, I did read this one. So I can assure you, <laughs> I analyzed this book thoroughly. Um, so this one is called Leave the World Behind, and it is by Ruman Alam. Now, uh, this book was on Barack Obama's summer reading list of 2021. So even though it was published in 2020, he put it on his um, mid-year reading list. Um, and I, I enjoy Barack Obama's writing. I think he's really um, intellectual without being condescending. Um, he just has a very easygoing um, conversational style of explaining complex things that maybe I wouldn't normally care about, like American politics, um, but in a way that makes it engaging and accessible for everyday readers, which I really appreciate. Um, and throughout the years that he's been doing this list, I think back to like 2016, maybe even 2015, um, yeah, every time he does his summer reading list or his year end list, um, I always find his selections really diverse um, and interesting and sometimes eclectic uh, and surprising. So um, I tend to, you know, trust um, that there is at least, even if it's not a genre maybe that I would read, um, that I trust that there is quality behind the writing for the books that he selects. Anyways. On to leave the world behind. Now uh, we start our book with Amanda and Clay. They are two Brooklynites with two teenage children and they want to get away from the city. So they have um, signed up for a week at an Airbnb type place, a luxury rental home in Long Island. So kind of not quite in the sticks, but far enough from the city that they feel that um, they can unplug for a bit giant kitchen with every amenity they could need while they are away, a swimming pool and a hot tub out back, just them, the kids, and hanging out and hopefully having a good time. Now, early on in their vacation, they hear a knock on the door. And when they open that door, there is a couple standing before them named George and Ruth. And they've showed up unannounced, um, and they ask to come in, but they are not just random people who happen to be passing by uh, this house. They are actually the owners of this house who had rented it to Amanda and Clay. Now, they normally live in New York City, uh, but there's been a blackout and they have left their Park Avenue apartment for their country home because staying in the city didn't seem safe. Now, at this point in the story, it is not really clear what precipitated the blackout, uh, why they maybe felt unsafe in the city and felt that they had to uh, retreat. Um, that is all very unclear, but they just felt the compulsion to get out of there. Um, they haven't been able to connect to media channels or with friends and family. So they are kind of like literally and figuratively in the dark. Soon though, other strange happenings start to occur, which make, um, which make all of these people in our story think maybe this is more than just a failure of the power grid. Now at the country home, hundreds of deer suddenly appear in the backyard, some strange change in migration path. Like this is this has not been anything that's been seen ever, let alone recent memory. A flock of flamingos is taking up in the swimming pool and splashing around and and just making themselves at home. And then on occasion, there are noises that are loud enough and sharp enough to crack the glass sliding doors of the house. These are all strange occurrences that they've all seen with their own eyes, but nobody can explain it. Nobody can um, connect their phones 
to try and get any media reports other than the occasional uh, blip of a alert saying, you know, there is a blackout in New York State. Stay home, don't go out. That is all they know. So kind of ironic that for the last book, the last episode of 2021, I decided to choose yet another post-apocalyptic tale. Um, but I guess, you know, old habits die hard. <laughs> this is a tale of disorientation, uh, not just because we as the readers and also the characters don't know what is going on, but it is also a, a story about um, the disorientation that Amanda and Clay, who are white and middle-class feel when the owners of the house, who are obviously very affluent, they own this country home, they live on Park Avenue, George and Ruth show up, mostly in part because they're Black. So for Amanda and Clay, who want to live the good life and have kind of been in their sort of happy little bubble, this is this is all very strange for them. And you can see that not only are they trying to reconcile, okay, what is going on in the outside world? Is our family in danger? How can we protect our family? But also reconciling being with these, in effect, strangers they've never met before that seem even stranger to them because they don't fit the profile of who they imagined to own the house. Um, so sad to say for Amanda and Clay who have been kind of in their own little world and preoccupied very much so with their own affluence or lack of affluence or their aspirations socially and culturally, um, this is a bit of a trip for them on many different levels. So I do want to have a caveat out there for this book. If you like reading books where things are all wrapped up nice and tidy, where, oh, that's what happened. Okay, that explains the flamingos and the deer and the blackouts. Um, you know, this is where the characters leave off. If you want a happy ending or a not so happy ending, this book kind of leaves you in limbo, sort of like how we are feeling right now at the end of 2021. Um, so if continued limbo is not your thing, if you just want one thing, in this one book to resolve itself. Um, this probably isn't the book for you, uh, but if you do want a book that does get you thinking about um, human interaction, um, sort of relationships between people's um, perceptions and you know things that maybe they didn't know about themselves in terms of what those perceptions are, um, then this might be a book that you'll want to pick up as well, in addition to myself and Barack Obama. So very <laughs> fine company that is Leave the World Behind, and it is by Ruman Alam. Thank you, Liz. I feel like you pretty much convinced me that this is a book I need to pick up because I love limbo, limbo, limbo. I love to know, I like to, I love to not know what's going on. <laughs> That is perfect. Perfect kind of ending for me. I can see Corinne is like completely, well, of course, completely off. No, I hate it. No, thank you. Just love it when there's like just this ambiguous ending. That's my one of my favorite things. So I definitely need to pick it up based on Liz's recommendation. Forget about Barack Obama. Liz is recommended. Um, all right. So I will talk about my book next. Um, so I chose this topic uh, mainly because this, I, I don't know about my book friends here, but this, it is, like I said, it is a reason why I pick up books sometimes. I just kind of look at like, oh no, who's on there? Who's saying like, who is like, you know, they, they have asked to, to, you know, like blow up the book because I'm sure like the, the publishers know how to market this book. They want to find the right audience. So, um, so and, and then there are a few offers that I'm like, well, because I like you so much that I'm going to pick stuff up because you recommend it, even though give it sounds like completely something that I would never read. Um, and one of them, of course, is Chow Xu. Um, you know that we love Chow Xu here. Um, you know, she wrote Interior Chinatown, uh, the only five-star book from all our book friends here. Um, and But before he wrote 
interior Chinatown, he is more famous for his first novel, which is How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. And of course, also his work on Westworld, the TV show. So we can see he's a lot more like kind of time travel -y, alternative reality type kind of, um, he's known for that. And so a lot of books that he blurbed um, very often had that kind of time travel aspect to it. But of course, knowing Chao Xu is not going to be a straightforward kind of story. It's all going to be like this really complicated narrative um, that, you know, you have to kind of work through. And I think this book that he recommended definitely has that. Um, what he said about this book is that it's funny, poignant, and powerful. This novel is a multiverse bursting with complexity and richness. And every time I thought it was done, revealing layers of reality, it surprised me with yet another of its many worlds. And in each of those worlds, Dexter Palmer explores so many big things, race, science, philosophy, marriage, and personal histories growing together and apart and together again. It's a moving story about love and loss and the lifelong tango of the possible with the inevitable. I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna be able to describe the book as well as Charles Yu does, but um, what I've got for you today is Version Control by Dexter Palmer. Um, so this book begins with Rebecca. Rebecca woke up one day and she's trying to describe to her husband, Philip, that something feels wrong. Like you can tell that you know, maybe the sun rose just a degree or two off from where it usually rises. Like the president that is talking on TV right now is like the wrong person, maybe. You know, something is wrong and she keeps feeling that like, you know, you walk into a room and you kind of forget why you walk into that room. Just something is not quite right. And Philip doesn't get it. Philip doesn't get what Rebecca is going on about. Like, and he's kind of brushing her off, not because like he's mean or anything. It's just that he just doesn't understand. It's just not how his brain work. And so it's a frustrating moment for both of them. Now, Rebecca works as a customer service representative at Lovability, a very successful online dating and matchmaking service. And basically her job is to solve customer issues by upselling. Like basically telling them that, you know what, if you just upgrade to the silver plan, then I am sure you are going to get way more messages from potential partners because your profile will be featured more prominently. And Rebecca is pretty good at her job. Philip is a physicist. He has his own science lab with his own team. And he has devoted many, many years on building a causality violation device. Now, please do not call it a time machine because when you say the word time machine and it's all the fault of all those science fiction out there that people get this fanciful idea of what time traveling is all about and, and what science is all about and what scientists do. But that's all wrong because in books, in movies, you only see those eureka moments. But real life science, nothing like that. It's a lot like slower, <laughs> like a lot slower. So you can't blame Philip for being a little bit of resentful of all these like, you know, people calling it time traveling, like a time machine, because it really affects his funding. You know, when people see the signs that Philip and his team does, and then when they kind of, like, when they see that there's nothing like what they imagine science to look like, people get really disappointed and funders just start putting their wallets back into their pockets. So, you know, like this really affects him. And he, he just, he's just so frustrated because it's been so many years and it, it feels like he's not really getting anywhere either, even though he knows he's right. But it turns out maybe Philip himself doesn't really quite understand what causality violation really means either. Just like Philip, when he's describing all the people in his story, I feel like we're all, as readers, a little bit tainted also by some of the other time travel stories that we know. And this book, I think, definitely offers a different kind of time travel story. And through that, you know, there's a lot of like big ideas, just like Charles, you said, a lot of big ideas being explored here. Free will, destiny, memories, histories, how they define us, how they affect how we act, about versions of ourselves. And you don't have to be a time traveler to have different versions of yourself because who you are at work, for example, is it really who you are at home? 
Is it who you are with your friends? You know, do we rewrite ourselves? Do we overwrite ourselves just like code, you know? And I have to confess, like I finished this book this morning. So I don't think I have enough time to process all those ideas yet, but it's definitely a very philosophical idea. I'm, I know I'm going to have to be like, keep thinking about like, what, what is Dexter Palmer really saying here? Um, it's a very thoughtful book, but when you, sometimes I find with science fiction, like big idea science fiction books sometimes feel very like distant, but this one doesn't feel like that because it was totally grounded by all the characters. As the book progresses, you, you get to learn more about Rebecca and Philip, how the relationship got started on lovability, in fact, and how this tragedy that happened has changed their relationship, something that they really don't know how to deal with. And then we meet all the other scientists in the lab. We meet Rebecca's fun-loving serial data friend, Kate. Even the security guards that sit outside the lab and check people's IDs before they let them in get a chapter or two from their perspectives. And all of these people are so well realized. And so with them grounding their story, you don't feel overwhelmed by all these like existential questions that the author is throwing at us. And yes, the story is set kind of in the future. You know, you got like self-driving cars, you get like these big data working to like put every person into like, oh, this is this person is just reducing them to like a list of like characteristics. You know, we've got 3D prints of food and all that stuff that out there that seems so far out, but not really. They talk about PS5 in there. This is a book published in 2016. And I was like, oh, PS5, wait, this is 2016. There's no PS5 yet, but you know, we have PS5 now. So, so a lot of common on technology and all that, but it still the story feels so immediate. It feels so like it happens today because the characters really, really drive the plot. And I love a science fiction when they put so much focus on the characters, but yet you can see just in the background, all these other ideas affecting it. Um, so yeah, I, if you love a character driven kind of science fiction story, um, but still like a lot of very thoughtful kind of story, please do check out Version Control by Dexter Palmer. You don't have to believe me, but you have to believe Charles Yu, it is a great one, so. So, Miss Corrine, what author are you reading whatever book you have for us today? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, this was a combination of authors that convinced me to read this book. Because um, as you say, like blurbs are a marketing tool and they're trying to show you like, if you like this author, then you'll probably like this. So this is kind of like a nice Venn diagram of, of authors or books that I have enjoyed. Um, and also, to be perfectly honest, I chose it because I'm the one who gave Liz so much grief about not reading her uh, best of picks. And then I had to eat my words because I went back and looked through my own list and realized I'd done the exact same thing. Um, so I, I did have to eat my words a little bit and apologize to Liz. And so this is one that I had picked as one of my most anticipated of the fall, I think. Um, but I just wasn't in the mood for it. Um, but thankfully, um, this book was blurbed by Steph Cha, uh, S.A. Cosby. And um, the reason why I really picked it up this time was because it was blurbed by Simone St. James, uh, who wrote The Sundown Motel, which was one of my favorite, favorite, favorite books of last year and has a new book coming out next year that I'm excited about. And the blurb for this particular book is that it is a delicious, twisted treat for lovers of noir. Uh, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia is a masterful writer who pulls you into her dark world and never lets you go. From the suspenseful slow burn plot to the crisp, desperate characters, you will be obsessed. Yeah, so that's a pretty, that's a pretty strong blurb by an author that I really like. So I, I to be honest, I picked this up in an airport. Um, and so it was very handy to have nearby. And this is the, the finally the time that I took the plunge and I read uh, Velvet Was the Night. And the book kind of asks the question of who wouldn't want to be the protagonist in a great story? Who wouldn't want to be the hero of an epic tale of romance and mystery and spies? Um, Maite would. Maite, lonely, bored, not sharp, recently just turned 30, a little bit over that hill, desperately wants to be the hero of a great story. 
preferably a romance story, if that could be swung. Um, she is a big fan of the genre. And her story starts with her neighbor asking her to take care of her cat. Uh, her neighbor, Leonora, is a beautiful, young, bohemian artist with lots of suitors who come in and out of her apartment at strange hours, who lives the amazing, fascinating life that Maite desperately, desperately wants. Maite is a secretary who works for a not very exciting law firm and mostly gets sent to buy socks for the owner of the law firm on her lunch breaks and kind of yearns for a life a little bit more exciting than that. So she agrees to take care of Lenora's cat as she goes away from the weekend, not because of any sense of altruism or because she feels for her neighbor or because she really wants to do someone a favor. No, Maite agrees for this for the sole reason that she will able to go into Leonora's apartment and steal something. Maite likes to help herself. Uh, she has a uh, pet sit for a number of her neighbors and while she is there kind of helps herself to their life for a little bit. She tries on their clothes. Uh, she tries their perfume, non-hygienically enough, tries on their makeup, including their lipstick. Um, and just kind of like tries on their life for a little while. And while she's there, she just kind of helps herself to a little souvenir of her time there. Uh, while she is there, um, she discovers that maybe Lenora's life is a little bit more than it seems to be on the surface. However, what really, really begins my taste story is when she tries to return the cat. Leonora asks her in a total panic that she's going to be going away for a lot longer than she thought she was going to. And so if she could bring her cat to a particular location and exchange it, she'll give her tons of money, three times what Maite was asking for. And she'll never see her again. And this would be such a great favor. Maite needs the money. Her car is broken down. She has to take the bus and it's awful. And so she decides to take the cat into a taxi and drive to this particular location and wait for Lenora. And she waits. And she waits and she waits and Lenora never shows. And so driven out of a sense that she belongs to some, a story much bigger than herself and her desire to get rid of this cat that she really does not care for, Maite decides to investigate where Lenora has gone. This story intersects with Elvis, who is a young member of the Hawks, a quasi-military counter-revolutionary, probably part of the government group, um, who is also searching for Lenora for their own reasons. The story has spies, government agents, secret police, a little bit of romance, um, but at the heart of it all is Maite's strong desire to just be a little bit more interesting and part of something bigger than herself. As Simone St. James said, this is a noir, so it is perfect for people who like uh, kind of like hard, boiled, dark, gritty look. Um, what I think is one of the big strengths of the book is it kind of like plunges you into 1970s Mexico City with all of the government corruption and the different student revolutionaries and all of the forces kind of convening on this small time and all biting for a piece of that pie with Maite, who's just a simple secretary caught in the middle of it all. So if you are looking for something that gives you a little bit of scenery, a little bit of atmosphere, and a little bit of like a dark gritty noir that you are looking for, and but with a really kicking soundtrack, and I know the books don't often have soundtracks, um, but because both Elvis and Maite are huge music fans and huge record collectors, there is actually a song list at the end of the book at all the uh, songs and records that are mentioned in this book, which I think are fantastic. Um, then you should definitely pick up Velvet Was the Night, the newest one from Silvia Moreno Garcia, who of course, uh, course wrote Mexican Gothic and Gods of Jade and Shadow, which were both mentioned on this podcast before. Thank you, Miss Corrine. It's always exciting to see what that author does next. What has she not done yet? Right? She did a kind of a horror, she did mystery, she's a noir now. 
fantasy. Retelling. Yeah, she did a gothic. She did a right. Cthulhu story. I think this is kind of like the first, maybe the first one that's not yeah. supernatural. Like it very much is mm. like you really see like Elmore Leonard in it. Like it's very much like mm. it feels like an LA confidential type, type of story. Mm. Um, yeah, so it really is like a left turn for her but I love that she is like picking up every genre that we think we know and just kind of like tearing it apart and making it her own which I think is really exceptional so yeah I, I'm very curious to see kind of what what she does next what else is left I feel like she's done so many things unicorn story I feel like it's going to be like a unicorn dragon slayer thing anthropomorphic animal story Something bad always happens to them. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you, everyone, for reading a book um, that is recommended by someone else. Um, you know, glad to uh, that you all found something. Um, and yeah, so next time you're in the library, if you're looking for a book to read, check out those little books on the side. Maybe it will help you decide what book to read next and what to pick up out of all the books and of course you can always stop by the information desk and ask for a good book um so thank you again last day of the year i know by the time people listen to this it will be the new year already but um wish everybody have a happy new year um and then we are going to go do some reading so we'll see you in the new year bye-bye happy new year everyone <laughs>